Other than more meant to Yes, yes, Okay, so rather than incriminate anybody further out there in the world, um, good evening everyone, good evening everyone. Yeah, John Nail is my name and uh, just a quick recap, I think we've got, no, only one you, I'll talk to you. So a while ago, Don was like, you'd be on heights with Don here and he'd be talking about things that he, you know, did in terms of investment and wealth creation. I'm talking to you, I don't, because everybody out here as well, you've heard this all before, but uh, you'd always spread all this information about wealth creation, so I put it on him to start doing events and here we are fourth edition Ryan welcome tonight for the first time hey, um, anyway so just a couple of housekeeping things before we kick off and I'll hand over to Don feel free to reach around and, and uh, actually unmute yourself you got a little switch there Don on the back just for entertainment there well, I won't make him do that in front of everyone on live as well can you feel a little switch oh I'll get to it hey I'll get to it it's on top a little slide switch little sl slide switch all those people out there Sennheiser you know thing they mics they got a little slide yep. switch for mm -hmm. unmuting anyway um, there, housekeeping wise, uh, toilets in the back, everybody's been here, know that, so if you need to go to the loo, Ryan, is in the en suite, feel free. Um, any, any sort of drama, we're just gonna run out of this place, that's our evacuation plan. What else do I normally say? Oh, take this all with a grain of salt. You know, this is all just opinions, personal opinions, my own and Don's as well. So whatever you learn tonight or take away is yours to go and prove or disprove on your own. And what's the other thing? Oh, phone's on silent. Can you put your phones on silent, please, if you haven't already done so? Um, just make sure we do that, particularly for our uh, online audience that's watching us on stream. Um, do, 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 do. I've only got one thing here in terms of a slide that I want to start on. It's where I started, where we started five, six weeks ago now, is just talk to that for a minute. And that's the thing is, we all love that saying, it works smarter, not harder, yeah? And I've kept harping on about it because I think it's just so relevant because the fact is, is that We've all got this, particularly in Australia, we thought, oh, work smarter, not harder. Actually, does it translate into French, Pascal? <coughs> Do they say this en français uh, or aussi? No? Aussi yeah. Yeah, it's not the, the, the French stand there and say, no, that's eat a baguette, not work or something. No, no, oh, sorry, I'm being politically incorrect. No, but <laughs> smarter, not harder is a classic thing in the Australian vernacular, isn't it? And I say sort of my version of that that I've adopted the past few years, and because I've always been labelled as smart, I've always, been that, you know, seen to be, oh, how did you work that out, John, you know? And there was always blame for that. But the one thing I never did was work hard, or not much, anyway. So anyway, what I've found, particularly in the past four or five years, is I've changed my business, changed my, my own mindset, changed my practices around the way I do things. It's made a big impact. I've worked smarter and harder, and the results are, well, they're right there in my bank account and in my lifestyle. So anyway, that's me done for now. Don, you can take over. I will check your uh, thing out. I've, I've, I've flicked us something across. Have you? So. Yep. I've you already checked. Check. You mentioned about phones also. Oh, have you, oh, have you done that? Do you, do I need to oh, check oh, yours? Oh, do I? Oh. All right. Don Kerr, Good. you're over right. to you, sir. Thanks, John. Right, we've gone through a few things in the last few weeks. We've gone through basics of investing. We've talked about investing in property and shares, even starting your own business. Uh, you can have all the knowledge in the world about what to do, but I have found that what's up here is even more important. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, you often hear people say, oh, I'm going to do it, you know, I'm a gunner, I'm going to do it, you know, they're gunners. And 10 years later, they're still saying they're going to do it. That's uh, one thing that I see all the time. There's been lots of studies on um, where they've done quite often over a long period of time, investigating successful uh, rich people, I don't mean people who inherited, but people who became rich during their, due to their um, efforts, and those who are poor. One of the first that I ever saw was actually, um, was it Rich Habits, Poor Habits? Who was who wrote that? There was Tom Corber and Napoleon Hill or something. Um, and there's been many studies since where they work at, where they investigate the highly successful rich people and the ones who don't get anywhere. And they found a number of characteristics. And I don't know whether they're innate and you can't do anything about it, 
I'm hoping it's not. I'm hoping you can work on it. I'm going to be challenging you tonight if there are any things that you don't do or don't have in your mind to maybe see if you can change it. Because I think that's the key to excess, success. You can have the knowledge, but you need to have this mindset to be successful. So we're going to go through a number of things. Um, the, uh, whoops, hang on. I've got my notes here that I'll refer to every now and then. Okay, there's going to be quite a few of these. Some of them I'm going to brush over quickly, some I'm going to elaborate on. One of them is that found is that somehow these very successful investors keep things simple. That's one thing they've noticed. They don't complicate things. Somehow they're very, very simple. They keep things simple. I know I do. Uh, by the way, whenever I've read these things, I thought, yeah, they're describing me. So that might be why I've been highly successful. Uh, they find that the people at the other end tend to make things complex. In fact, that's what stops them. Oh, investing, it's too complex. I don't know what to do. It's too hard. It's not hard. It's simple. Always remember that. Keep it simple. Investing is really very easy, as I've been talking about in the last few weeks. So that's the first thing. Um, Second thing they found is that they tend to be very much in control of their lives. They don't lose it. They keep their emotions in check. You know, you get these people who get very angry. They don't tend to get angry. They don't tend to blurt out, you know, get angry and say something they shouldn't have said. They tend to be very relaxed and in control of their lives. Um, I remember an incident with my daughters. I remember driving somewhere when my daughters, I think my daughters were about 10 and 6 or something. And we're driving somewhere and they said, uh, one of them said, Dad, if someone murdered one of us, would you get angry? <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> I said, why not? I said, it doesn't help. I said, I'd be sad and I hope they catch them so they don't murder someone else. And I said, but you wouldn't get angry? I said, no, it doesn't help. I said, Dad, we've never seen you angry. Remember I see about keeping calm and in control? That's one other aspect of these highly successful rich people that they find. They don't get angry, they don't lose it. They tend to be very relaxed and calm. Does that describe you? And if it doesn't, could it? Could you change to that? Like I said, getting angry does not help. Getting stressed does not help, does it? How does getting stressed help? Right. Another thing they find is that they're always learning. Reading. These days, we're very lucky. There's so much stuff on YouTube. There's uh, blogs. You don't have to read a whole book. In fact, you don't need to read any books, it seems, these days. There's so much information there on the web. And these people, it's lifelong. Whereas they find people at the other end, they tend to avoid it. They uh, watch TV a lot. You know, they come home, get a beer, drink, have, have uh, sit down watch TV, what a waste of time. Netflix. Yeah, Netflix and all that. Uh, they don't find that the highly successful people tend to even want to do that. You tell them, do you want to have a night just sitting watching a movie on Netflix? What for? So, um, so they're always learning. <coughs> Another thing they find is that these rich people don't seem to be Fearful or doubtful, if I could put it that way. It's a bit hard to explain. Um, they, they're, not, they're not scared of failing. They don't have doubts. Uh, in fact, they see failures as a learning experience. You get a lot of people, you know, failures build up on their back and all that, and that dragging them down. They see them as steps to get up. And they say, oh, another failure, but I learned from that. 
So they don't stress out about failures either. So they're, they're very, very relaxed about that. Looking at this wealth pyramid, by the way, I might just make a slight diversion. As I've had up for a little while, you've been looking at it. There, there are many versions of this around, by the way. This is just, I don't know where I even got this one. Uh, level zero to level four. What do you think level zero is? Maybe in debt, can't pay your bills. Yeah, yeah you get people who, you know, they're, they're constantly running short of money. They use payday lenders because they've got to pay a bill and they haven't got it, so they do these ridiculous payday loans at something like 80% when you work out the yearly rate just to get through till they get their next pay. That is financially instability. Right, you imagine if you lost your job, how devastating that would be, or a medical bill for one of the kids. That is financial instability, that's the level zero. What about level one, financial stability? Any ideas what that would look like? Working for the government, yeah, that's, they're good jobs, aren't they, usually? <laughs> um, I would put someone in there who they don't have to worry about getting a payday loan because they've got backup money. They might have 20000 in the bank or an offset account or a redraw on their home loan. They could survive maybe three or preferably even six months if they lost their job before they'd start to suffer financial stress. That's what I'd put in level one. Level two, I would put that as someone who has reached a point in their investing that they could stop work and survive. If they lost their job, their investments, they might have share, a share portfolio, for example, that might be bringing in 20,000 a year or even 15, it's enough to just survive, right? So you've got security. It's not nothing special, but it's secure. Level three, financial freedom, is where your passive income from investments is enough to maintain the lifestyle that, that you are accustomed to. So if you needed, say, 50,000 a year to be able to survive, pay all your bills and extra things like entertainment and buy kids birthday and Christmas presents, things like that without stress. That would be financial freedom. Financial abundance is where you've got extra beyond what you need. So you can start doing things like, you know, you can help charities. Uh, you can build up, you know, you can start a business, all sorts of things. You've got the you got this excess income above what you need. So that's abundance. You've got more than you need. But that's one example of five levels. You'd probably get another person who'd come up with slightly different definitions of each. That's not the point. Have you worked out where on that you are? That's not the point I'm making either. A lot of people get to that point and they stay there their whole life. Might be level two, for example. I believe you should, if you're at level two, be looking at level three. You don't get satisfied with what you got. You say, can I get to the next level? And when you get to the next level, can you possibly get to the one after that? Whereas a lot of people just sit back and say, okay, I've got financial security, that'll do. You may be happy with that, but you tend to find the people who are successful are always looking at getting to the next level. Okay. So that's the A wealth pyramid. Um, right, another thing they found with highly successful people is that they tend to be very open-minded. They're open to ideas. They're, 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 they're not, you know, you get a lot of people who are closed-minded. You know, they, uh, it might be politically or socially or beliefs, could be religion or whatever. They're very closed-minded. 
they find that these people who are highly successful are always open to other ideas. Whereas people at the other end, at the bottom end, tend to be highly closed-minded. They've got their beliefs, it's never going to change. They've been a political supporter of one party all their life and they won't even open up their mind to something else. Uh, or they've got beliefs about uh, natural therapies or something. The highly successful ones have always been very open-minded. Are you open-minded? And if you're not, could you be? Could you change that in your life? Uh, <clears throat> Another one is they tend to be very, very persistent. Uh, they realise that the more work they do, the better they'll do. There's uh, a wonderful poster I saw. It's a motivational one. 1.01 1 .01 to the 365 comes to 37.8. Put in an extra 1% effort in for 365 days a year. Gives you 37.8. Try it on your calculator sometime. 0.99 to the 365 is equal to 0.03. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Do 1% less than 100% over time. Anyway, that's, uh, it was on something called the, the greatest motivational poster ever. I still remember that. I've got a copy of it somewhere. So, this is what they find with these highly successful people is they'll keep they'll keep working, they'll keep at it, they won't give up, whereas people at the bottom end often don't even start. The idea of being persistent is, is just not in their... Uh, uh, another thing, by the way, they find with these highly successful people is they do a lot of dreaming. So what was it, Daryl Kerrigan in the castle said, I'll tell him he's dreaming. That's, uh, that's the sort of talk of someone at the bottom end. <laughs> it's same with sports stars, by the way, for example. A lot of them said the reason they got to Wimbledon or uh, won the US Masters or whatever, they dreamt of it. And that's what kept them going. Swimmers, while they're swimming up and down the pool, are dreaming about being on the dais at the Olympics. It's a good thing. It gives you that motivation. They find that uh, about the only thing the poor people at the bottom dream about is winning gold lotto. <laughs> it's not your effort that gets you there, it's a matter of luck if you ever did do it. So, which brings me to another point they find, is that the highly successful people don't gamble. At all. In fact, they've never even considered it. Whereas the bottom end, it's pretty well almost universal, they gamble regularly. Gambling is a mugs game. You're not going to win. If you win gold lotto, you might be very, very lucky. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry, I took a wrong turn yeah. and ended up in traffic. That's alright, we haven't been going too long. Come on in. <laughs> yep, you found us. I'm Tracy. Hello, Tracy. <laughs> the one that can get lost. Yeah, that's alright. We. That's happened before, you're not the first. No. <laughs> yep, I'm Don. Hello. Hi. Yeah, so uh, I was on gambling, yeah. Um, I did speak briefly about this in the first seminar, about a lady, Justine, who was gambling and gave it up. She was spending $10 a week on things like gold lotto and that. Started investing and instead by 37 she was a millionaire. She was a single mum. So we'll do that story in 101. We do repeat these series, by the way, if you missed the earlier ones. All you're doing really is making places like the casinos, the race courses, and the bookies rich. Gambling is a mugs game. I usually say, look, if $2 a week gold lotto gives you entertainment value, $2 entertainment value, or go for it. For the number of people I've heard, oh, what's your future financial plans? Oh, when I win gold lotto. Yeah, good luck with that. So, um, yeah, so, Gambling is definitely out. Um, 
Another thing they found, the difference between very successful and the people at the opposite end of the scale, is that the rich people, even when they were poor, by the way, before they were rich, always made sure they lived within their means. They found the poor people were always spending more than they earned, therefore they were ending up with credit card debt, happened to sacrifice later to, to get it back. It's the old, you know, there's, a, there's a, an attitude in society at the moment of wanting to have it now. That's why you have things like afterpay becoming very popular. But they're not willing to wait. I, I, by the way, have never had a car loan. I've always paid cash. One, one principle in investing, by the way, is you should never borrow for something that goes down in value only up in value. So investing in property or shares something or a business, something that's going to go up in value is good stuff. Investing for any, uh, borrowing for anything that goes down in value should be avoided. I know sometimes when people are starting out and they're 18 and they need a car and they don't have the money, they might need a car loan, but your aim should be to get to the point where you never ever need to have a car loan again. So, and living within your means, is part of that. Uh, I, by the way, with credit cards, I got a credit card when they first came in back about 1971 or 72. So I've had credit cards for what, 50 years now. I have never paid interest on a credit card. I'd object to it, you know, 20% or something like that. And I can clearly remember in the 70s, I might have gone to the shops and thought, oh, I'd like that. How much is that? 40 bucks? I got my card, I said, oh no, I can't get that, I won't be able to pay it off at the end of the month. So I wouldn't buy it. It's not the attitude that a lot of people have to now, and I believe that's holding a lot of people back. The number of people I see in my work as a mortgage broker who are deep in credit card debt, and it's all to do with this not living within their means, and they say, I've got to have it now. It's a bit of what we used to call years ago called keeping up with the Joneses. So they'd work hard, exhaust themselves just to keep up with the Joneses. By the way, I usually notice the Joneses are exhausted too. So, um, which is part of, they practice delayed gratification. One, one thing they found as well, by the way, is a lot of people like, like to do spreadsheets, and we talked about that earlier too, like doing spreadsheets of you know, your assets and your debts, and you subtract them, and you've got your net worth and all that. And you also got the cash flow. You know, you might have rent coming in and your wage and you've got loan, loans going out and living costs. This is the asset side. Things that you've got like property and shares. This down here is the income side. They found that the highly successful people, even when they're poor, this is what they're concentrating on. They're not overly concerned about that as long as they can handle it. They're looking at the asset spreadsheets. The poor and middle classes were always concentrating on it. They weren't even really thinking about this, about what they're worth. So that was another difference. The, the highly successful people are always assessing their assets. The only reason they'd look at the income side is just to make sure that they can afford their, their costs. Whereas the, 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 uh, the non-highly successful, this is middle and low, by the way, that was all, all they were looking at. What are you looking at all the time? The income or your asset base and where that's going, which is part of another one. They tend to have very long-term plans. John might be talking about goals later, setting goals, but they tend to have long-term plans like I mean 10 years minimum. So they're looking way ahead, not just next weekend. You know, what are you gonna do next weekend and how am I gonna pay my bills for, for next month and that? So they plan way ahead. Um, doo -doo -doo. Another thing they found with the highly successful people, and this has been in many studies, is that they love their work. They found people at the poor end. It was something like, uh, I saw some statistics not long ago. It was something like 86% of the people they put in the highly successful range liked their job. 
the other 14 or 13 percent or something loved their job, whereas something like 76 percent of the people at the bottom end hated their job. And quite often they were the same jobs, by the way. It wasn't that they were better jobs and they were terrible jobs. It was quite often the same jobs. So if you enjoy your job, that's a big help. And if you're not, why not? And there are two things you can do there. One is change jobs, the one that you might like. But can you actually turn your job around so you do enjoy it? Try to change your attitude. Say, well, I like going to work, meeting the workmates. I might work in a factory where we chat and all that. Enjoy it. It makes a big difference to your mental state and to your success in life. Another one they found with the highly successful people was that they were very patient in everything. Whereas at the bottom end, they tend to be very impatient. That's where probably where they had to buy now. You know, I've got to get it now. I don't want to wait. I'll do an afterpay thing so I can get that new uh, plasma TV now. The uh, uh, See, with, with investing, it's long term generally. You, you don't generally make quick money in investing. It's over the years. You have a boom in property about every 10 years. You've got to wait. I saw a little while ago, over 55%, I think it was, of people who buy an investment property, their first investment property, sell within five years. You're not giving a chance for a boom to happen, are you? So they're not hanging in there. I've told the story before about my ex-wife. Uh, I'll tell it again, those of you who have heard it, tough luck, you have to hear it again. Um, uh, I'll give you a bit of a timeline. I got married in 1986, and Carol was her name, and she was a big fan of super, and I wasn't super. You know, they boast if you get 400,000 by retirement with super, all you've got to do is buy one investment property and pay it off, and you'd have more than that. So, but I finally convinced her, and in no time at all, um, once I convinced her super wasn't and property was a good thing, I just watched in amazement. In fact, in one day we bought four properties, I remember. One day. And uh, that was mostly her, by the way, not me. She was a real doer. And uh, I remember that was 1993. We bought four properties in one day. And we kept buying more and more. And it was almost from day one she was saying to me, when are the properties going up? I said, they will. When? I said, I don't know, but they will. I said, we're paying a lot of money for these loans, you know, millions of dollars worth of loans. And I said, yeah, but we're still having overseas holidays and still, still seem to be buying clothes all the time. We just got a new car not long ago. I said, yeah, but I could get a lot more if we didn't have all this debt. And in 1999, we separated and we split everything. Um, in early 2004, by the way, we had a boom 01 to 03, where my properties pretty well all tripled. It continued past 03, but early in 04, I was driving somewhere with my older daughter, who was about 16 at the time, and she said, Dad, you still got all your properties? And I said, yeah. And I said, uh, have they gone up a lot? I said, oh, yeah. I said, have you made a lot of money? I said, too right. And I said, you know, Mummy sold hers. I said, oh, did she make a lot of money too? And said, no, she sold them three years ago. Just before the boom. She was impatient. Right? A lot of investing is hanging in there. You may say, oh, gee, they're not going up. Why not? Just hang in there. It's uh, patience. is uh, a big part of investing. Um, in fact, I believe impatience is one of the biggest enemies of investing. Right, um, one big thing they found, and this is going to sound a bit odd, but they found that highly successful people were skeptics. Now I know that has a negative connotation. I'm not talking about the sort that's uh, anti-vaxxers, that sort of thing. Or, you know, think that there's conspiracies everywhere. I'm not talking about that. 
I'm talking about rational skepticism, scientific skepticism, and questioning things. They found that the highly successful people, being open-minded, I guess it's part of that, weren't easily convinced and they had to prove it for themselves. So I'm talking about positive scientific skepticism, not blindly believing what they've read in the papers or heard in the news or what the guy over the fence told them about something. They were open-minded and keen to find out the truth in a rational way, a positive way too, by the way. It was quite often, they found that they, were, they weren't nasty. You get these nasty you know, conspiracy people who attack people because they disagree. They're pleasant about it, and they say, oh, we just want the truth. And like John says at the start of this, don't believe everything we say. Go and research it yourself. Well, that's the sort of people they are, skeptics. Good skeptics, by the way, and which I believe everyone should be. But they find that the highly successful investors don't just accept things. And they don't go irrational about it either. Like, like the, a lot of people think of skeptics as the irrational people who, you know, go off on, on crazy ways. You know, there's, apparently there's over a million people in the US who believe the major rulers of the world are an alien lizard race. You heard that one? Look it up. They, they, they can take human form, so they look like us, but people like the royal family, the US president, are actually alien lizard forms who can transform to look like us. Over, over, over a million people in the US actually believe that. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you might believe it with Donald Trump, yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> right, one other thing is that, uh, have you heard people say things like, uh, uh, money is the root of all evil? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, the, it's a bi biblical quote, I think. The biblical yeah. quote isn't actually, uh, money is the root of all evil. Does anyone know what the actual quote is? The love of money is evil or something like that. Yeah, it's... Um, um, Yeah, and, uh, you know, money corrupts you, that sort of thing. I don't believe that. One of the things I find with the highly in, um, successful people is that they have a very positive attitude to money. You imagine if we didn't have money. We'd be back to bartering. You know, you do work for me and I give you apples off my apple tree. That was a terrible system because of the arguments about how many apples. Money is a very, very, very neat way of sharing resources and services. You do some work for me, I can pay you. Right, and there are, there are systems in place to give an idea of what that money is worth. It's actually a very, very good thing. And what they found is that the highly successful people have a positive attitude to money. The bottom, people at the end, at the bottom end, tend to have a very negative attitude about money. You know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. They're always quoting things like that. And, uh, you know, they just do it for money, all this sort of thing. It's, uh, um, in fact, Ayn Rand, I don't know if you've heard of Ayn Rand, philosopher. She uh, was uh, very much um, uh, into various parts of philosophy, rationalism and so on. And she had a beautiful quote one time. I, I wish I, I haven't been able to find it. It was one of her novels where she basically says that if you earn money, you respect it. If you get money without earning it, you don't. So if you do a hard day's work and you get $200 or something from the boss, you worked hard for it, you respect it. This is where quite often people on Centrelink they don't earn their money. They have very, very low respect for the whole concept of money. And that's what they found. The highly successful people have a rational, positive attitude to money. Whereas the people at the bottom are always saying, oh, you know, it's terrible, it's, you know, it's uh, evil, and uh, pharmaceutical companies are just out to make huge profits, and all oh, the banks are ripping us all off. It's all negative. Uh, whereas the 
highly successful ones have a very positive attitude. I believe it goes further than that. You know how they say people say, oh, money changes you? He was okay till he got money now. Now look at him. I don't believe money changes you. I believe money makes you more of what you actually are. And that's what I've noticed over the years. If you're stingy, money makes you more stingy. If you're generous, money allows you to be more generous. If you're haughty, money makes you more haughty. If you're naughty, money makes you more naughty. All sorts of things like that. It's, uh, so I don't believe it changes you. It just allows the inside you to come out more. It opens you up. A bit like alcohol. I, I personally believe, you know, when, when someone gets drunk and they get angry and violent, I think it's just bringing out their inner person. They're a violent, angry person. When I drink too much, I fall asleep. No, I'm, I'm relaxed and totally everything. If you're arrogant, you may become more arrogant when you get drunk. If you're, if you're uh, crazy, you become more crazy. Similarly with money, it brings out the real you. It allows you to bring out the real you because you've got those options. So remember that having a negative attitude to money is the loser's attitude. It is actually a really good thing. And in the hands of the right people as well, it's really good. Of course, there's always evil in everything. You know, the, you hear of criminals and the drug trade and all that. Um, that doesn't say it's bad. It's just that the bad element will always make it, um, take advantage of anything. I remember reading something years ago that when photography came in, cameras and photography, the, there was a huge backlash against it, saying it was going to uh, um, encourage pornography. Well, it did. Pornography became a bit more prevalent when photography came in. But is that a reason to get rid of it? Would you like to say, well, we can't all have photographs? Because some people use it for pornography. It doesn't wipe it out. The bad element's going to make use of whatever they can. It doesn't say it's bad and we should get rid of it. Because for most of us, photography is fantastic. We've got photos of our kids to remember and family events and so on. So, um, Having now gone through characteristics of the highly successful, now let's go through some characteristics of the people who were at the bottom end. Is it coming in, is it? Yeah, there we go. It was noisy, wasn't it? Okay, to start with, we said before that the high, highly successful people had an open mind, were open to new ideas. They find generally the ones at the bottom have very closed minds very set in their ways. Are you very set in your ways? Or are you open-minded uh, and looking at uh, broad range things? Another thing they found they had a lot of was uh, what, what is called a victim mindset. I'm a victim. The reason I'm there, they'll blame everyone, the government. You know, uh, education, either bad schooling or bad parents, or society. They don't find people at the top ever do that. They take responsibility for themselves, but people at the bottom always seem to have this idea that they want someone to blame. They won't take responsibility for where they are. It's always society or the government or something, or the police. Now, it's like I remember hearing once a uh, a guy was in jail and his girlfriend came to visit him and said, oh, what's wrong? He said, oh, it's the police's fault. They caught me. <laughs> Gee. <laughs> yeah, it's not my fault. It's the police. Um, yeah, they blame everyone. As I said, the wealthy, wealthy never do this. Another thing they find very strong in those people is this idea of entitlement. I'm entitled. Society owes me. You probably heard that said. Uh, no one owes you anything, really, when you think about it. You were born in this world. Any advantage you get, you should be grateful for. A good education, a good health system. 
you're not entitled to it. You're just lucky you were born in a time where you got it. No one owes you anything. That is the mindset of the top people. And, that, that, and they found that they are very grateful for what society there. We are very lucky to be born into this society. We, don't, we didn't earn it to be born in it. You know, we've got beautiful homes, we've got health care, we've got good food, we've got education. You go back 300 years ago, you bring someone from 300 years ago in today and tell this is the average person's lifestyle, they'll say, that's like a king. But we didn't earn this, did we? We did nothing to earn what we've got. We should be grateful for what we got. I'm not saying we shouldn't have health care, but these people have an idea that they're entitled. They, they're never grateful for it, by the way. They just say, oh, it's expected, I'm entitled to it. Oh, society owes me. The highly successful people never think that way. No one owes me a thing. Anything I get, I am very grateful for. In fact, that's why they often are generous with their money in donating back to things like hospitals and research and education, you know, they sponsor schools and things like that because they're grateful for what they've got. And it's not just when they got rich, they found out they liked that even before they were rich. They had the same mindset. It's just when they got money, they were able to do more of it. Another thing they found with the people at the bottom is they, say, they often say things like, oh, my life is hopeless. I was born, you know, in a bad situation. Uh, you okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just need to stand. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, um, that they believe they're stuck and can't get out. But I was born into a poor situation poor family. I have met so many people who are born into poor situations who still have succeeded. All you've got to do is when you, if you get a job, when you should be able to get a job, is have the right mindset. You don't spend more, you, you spend less than you earn so you've got money to save and you can get out of it. And I could tell you dozens of cases I've met where people who were in that bottom situation in society and they rose out of it. I'll give you one example. I was, uh, um, back in 1980, I was a, a maths physics teacher at Cavendish Road State High School, uh, over that way a bit. And I had this year 10 class, and there was a boy in the class called Daryl. And he was a very popular guy, always smiling, blonde hair, and, you know, nice looking and very pleasant. Everyone, you know, very popular. And he used to work really hard in maths, very hard. And in every exam, he got something like about 20%. So he didn't do well. He just wasn't good at maths. Um, but he was kept smiling and all this, and uh, he kept trying hard. I, I, I often used to think, gee, if I got 20%, I'd give up. But no, he worked hard. He was the hardest worker in the class. Um, I taught him in year 10, and about nine years later, I was in Nidderpilly shopping town and this guy came over to me and said, uh, Mr. Kerr? I said, yeah, maths teacher. He said, well, yeah, I was, yeah. And I said, he said his name and I recognised him then. Uh, you know, guys tend to get angled, you know, like jaw bones and things like that rather than when they're kids. So I didn't recognise him at first. He said, you got a few minutes spare? Let's go and get a coffee together. I said, sure. So I said, uh, what did you do after, after school? He said, oh, no one would give me a job. My results were terrible. So what'd you do? He said, I put an ad in the paper saying I'd mow lawns, chop down trees, that sort of thing. And I said, oh, okay, and so how'd that go? He said, oh, I was inundated. Phone kept ringing and next thing I knew I'd employed six guys and I had a couple of trucks and uh, mowers and chainsaws and trailers and all this to take stuff. And I said, and how's that going now? He said, oh, I sold that for a big profit. And I said, what are you doing now? He said, I got a fleet of about 30 trucks. And I said, so how's that going? So my accountant says I'm now worth about seven million at 24. Why was he successful, by the way? Persistence. Hmm? Persistence. Yeah, doesn't he have a lot of the things I put said here? Even though he was hopeless, it was the fact that he did keep trying hard. 
He didn't care if the results were bad, he was persistent. He didn't sit back and say, oh, my life is bad, you know, I've no good, I'm no good at academics, I'll just sit on the dole and if I'm lucky I might get a labourer's job. He had the mindset that, you, that I've been describing. He was open to ideas, he was persistent. I can imagine his, his employees would have loved him because he was so pleasurable. I said, how are you handling a business, you know, if you're not, you don't, don't have the skills and all those. So I, I just employ smart people to do all that stuff. So, so you can see that you can drag yourself out. It's not hopeless. In fact, I'd say I dragged myself out of that too. Um, I never got any help along the way. When my mother died, I got about 4,000 inheritance. That's the only money I've ever been given. And uh, I've been very, very successful, and so have my five brothers and sisters. We independently are all worth mil millionaires several times over without really any hope, and we rose sort of out of that. Another thing that they find with the people at the bottom compared to the people, highly successful ones, the ones at the top are very unselfish, often generous with their time and money and sponsoring things. Even when they were poor, they were doing that. The ones at the bottom, they find it generally very, very selfish. Very, very inward looking in that way. You know, it's all about me. I'm entitled. It's all part of that. I'm entitled. Uh, society owes me. It's all tied in together. But they find that uh, the highly successful people are generally very unselfish. Uh, another thing they find with people at the bottom is they're envious of others. Or as oh, he's just lucky he got a head start. You know, he, he had good, you know, good schooling and all that, and everything went right for him. He was born into society in a rich thing. They're envious. You don't find people at the t highly successful ones of that. I've never been envious of Bill Gates, even though he's miles ahead of where I am. It just doesn't enter their psyche. They've worked hard, they've earned it. So why should I complain about them if they uh, worked hard and earned it? Whereas the bottom at the bottom, the people at the bottom generally were very envious of the successful. Um, another one they find with people at the bottom is they're very, very risk averse. They don't like taking risks. I mean, gambling's a risk, but that's about it. They'll buy their gold lotto hoping to win millions of dollars. That's about their level of risk. The idea of stepping out on their own is scary to them. Whereas people at the top, yeah, let's go for it. Let's try it. Let's get in and do it. We're not going to be a gunner. We're going to get out there and do it. So, uh, um, in fact, Robert Kiyosaki, one of his quotes was, uh, um, was that uh, losers are people who are afraid of losing. That was one of his quotes, yeah. Losers are people who are afraid of losing. So they're very risk averse. Um, they, they tend to think risk, you know, investing is risky. I'm not smart enough. Uh, investing is complex, whereas highly successful people s keep it simple. Um, um, and the other thing they find, and I mentioned this earlier with the top people, is people at the bottom tend to be very, very much time wasters. They might work seven and a half hours a day. The rest of the day is really wasted. I'll sit and watch Netflix. I'm going to have a beer on the back. You know, their, their idea of a good time is a six pack and a bug zapper on the back veranda. That's their idea of entertainment. They don't think about using their time value, uh, to learn uh, and improve themselves. They tend to be very, very wasteful of their time. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about before I hand back to John, I'm going to be handing back to you before long, John. Did you hear that? Got, I'm going to be turning back to you soon, so get oh, ready. Okay, soon. Yep. Okay. The last thing I'm going to talk about is, and I, this is very, very dear to my heart, is don't get involved with toxic people. 
I continually meet people in my job who are in devastating financial positions because they are involved in to with toxic people. It was either a, a friend who they are investing with, or it could be a workmate who's messed them around so much, or a, someone they went into business with. But the one I think I see most of is breakups of marriages. Do you know what a narcissist is? What is a narcissist? Someone who doesn't care about anyone else but themselves. Someone? Exactly, yeah. They are the center of the universe. Everything is about them. Everyone else in the world is there for their benefit. They're, and I see it all the time. I have had a run lately of ladies in their 50s who went through a marriage breakup. The ex was a narcissist, kept them under control all through the marriage. They were scared of them virtually, walking on eggshells. Took nearly everything in the breakups because they hid a lot of it quite often because they were controlling all the money. And they end up sort of out on their own in their 50s, might have, if they're lucky, have 80,000 in the bank and they've got to start again and find a home and start again in their 50s. There is a stack of information on the net in YouTube about narcissists. I strongly recommend you all have a look at some of that. Narcissists you can meet at your work. It could be family members, like even parents or your kids or siblings. It could be friends, toxic friends. But the worst is a toxic partner. To give you some idea of some of the characteristics of a narcissist, one, one, one series I do like, I don't know if I could call it up there. If you Google 30 days of narcissism, there was a Dr. Romani, I think her name is, did a beautiful series where each day for 30 days she went through a different characteristic of a narcissist. It was a very, very good series. And she's done a lot of other stuff too about how to recognize a narcissist, how to handle a narcissist, how to talk to them and treat, how to <coughs> treat them. Her basic, uh, her basic tenet, by the way, is if you're involved with a narcissist, get away if you can. If it's a family member, you not, might be able to. One thing they found in research about narcissists is they never change. They never reform. They will always think that they're the only one that matters. You're not going to change them. A lot of criminals are that. You know, they'd say, I oh, will re rehabilitate them and let them out. They just reoffend. They're going to do the same thing again. They have a lack of empathy. They have a strong idea of entitlement. This is where I think a lot of burglars, probably a narcissist, they feel they're entitled to your stuff. I can take your stuff, you don't, you don't really deserve it, I deserve it, so I'm going to take all your stuff. People sometimes think, how can you be a burglar and do that to people? How nasty. They don't think that way, they say, they're, I'm entitled to whatever I want. They are very manipulative and they actually have strong tactics, which are, you'll see a lot of them on YouTube tactics they use to get control and be manipulative. They tend to be very paranoid about things. They think everyone's out to get them as well, so they've got to be highly defensive. Um, they are constant liars. They can be extremely jealous. They tend to be cheating spouses. They think nothing of having an affair because they feel they're entitled to it and everyone's there for my use anyway. Um, one thing, by the way, that is very strong in them is if they don't get their way and get caught out, what happens? Tizzy spit. Hmm? Tizzy spit. Yeah, they don't get... Angry is not the right word. It's rage. Not anger, they go into an absolute rage. Remember something like about early last year, some guy threw petrol over his car with his ex-wife and three daughters in? Is that rational? What father, what decent father? A father normally would do anything to save their kids. That was totally narcissist behavior. He didn't get his way, so what happened? He went into a rage. Domestic violence is generally a narcissist who didn't get his way and he goes into rage. 
and you're never going to change them. I believe every girl, you know, sort of in her late teens, should be forced to watch some of these things so they don't get caught in these relationships because they get caught in them and don't realise until it's too late. And they're usually trapped because the, the husband is controlling all the money so they can't get away. They say, where do I go? I don't have any money. He's, he controls all the bank accounts and the money. What am I going to do? I can't leave. So they trap you in. Um, they, uh, have you heard of gaslighting? Yeah. What's gaslighting? And where did the term come from? Anyone know where the term gaslighting came from? Yeah, it was a movie. I think it was actually called Gaslighting, I think. It was, it was way back about the 1940s. There was a husband and wife, and he was trying to slowly get his wife to think she was going mad. He'd do things like turn down the gas lamps and turn them up. And so, is the gas lamps going? No, everything's fine. So slowly over time, she thought, am I crazy? And that's what his aim, to make her think she was crazy. So the term now is gaslighting. They tend to say things like, I never said that. Or they'll accuse you of saying, oh no, you definitely said that yesterday. No, I, I didn't say that, did I? So you start to question your sanity. That's called gaslighting. They slowly work over time, so you start to doubt anything you've ever said or heard because they're saying, no, you definitely said it. Or, or I definitely didn't say that. Um, yeah, and uh, they have other characters. Like I said, there's 30 days of it. You've got a different one every one. There's one called, what's it called? Um, uh, Shaden Freud. Anyone know what that is? Shaden Freud. Hmm? Yes, exactly. They take pleasure in seeing someone else's misfortune. They rather than say, oh, good, he's going through trouble having a hard time, yeah, good stuff. They'll actually enjoy it. It's a German term, Schade Freud or something like that, and it means uh, pleasure in seeing someone go through misery or harm. So, um, that's about all I've got to say. The, the main thing I want to get through tonight is have a think about the way you think. It will strongly impact how you succeed not just in investing, in life, in your other activities like work, family relationships. Uh, but as I said tonight, you're investing. John. Thank you, Doc. I'm new to myself after the lesson I gave you earlier. But um, and maybe if you can actually just give, show, us, show us your backside for a second. Just um, mute you out. There we go, so we don't have to listen to you snoring when I start talking. Now, um, thank you very much, Don. Now, I hope everybody got a lot out of that. And maybe a good place to start right now is, look, out there watching us online or in the crowd tonight, there's normally one or two people that Don strikes a chord with that, that talk about uh, nasty, you know, narcissist people. So if you are, you know, if that struck a chord for you and all of a sudden there's something going on for you mentally, you know, reach out to myself or Don. We can put you in contact with people who with those sorts of issues. So it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but Don's right. There's so much of that going on. And one story I can relate is even, you know, how a lifelong friend of mine, or actually the first guy I ever worked for, he got involved in a relationship and at, over time he found himself, well, he, well, we found him, just turned against all of us. He turned against all these um, adolescent friends, all the people he knew. And in fact, I actually even ended up in business with him, owned a boat with him it all ended up in liquidation court. You know, we had a successful, profitable business that was making a quarter million bucks a year, and for me to get away from him as quick as I could, it ended up in a liquidation. And it was ugly. And that was because he got involved with a certain woman who then turned him against all his friends. So you just never know where it's coming from, so just be warned, yeah? Okay, so anyway, let's not uh, go on with that. What I do want to do, though, is, is go through, and I've got bullet points for you here, and as Don has gone through the, the details, as um, what I'd like to do is just revisit with these, any of these that you want to write down and go with and go through. So, and just my own little spin on these. So this is kind of a summary and a bit of a bullet point for you to go back and actually look at what this, this stuff actually means for you. Where do you sit? So if we go back, for instance, back one step, back to the wealth pyramid, 
Has everybody got in their mind where they feel they are on that wealth pyramid? Has everybody got an impression of that? I'd like to see everybody nod their head and say, yeah, I'm at that point. Now, actually, is it a book here? I can't see it. Uh, Tony Robbins, unshakable, thick book on financial welfare. He went and interviewed a bunch of people and turned that into a book. Um, there's actually a thicker version of that, which actually is a really hard read, but it's a, even that unshakable. He talks about that very fact. And in my little book of dreams, or actually there's in volume two now, started out with the gold one, went to blue. It was given to me for free, both of these. But I actually went through that process. And if you think about it long and hard, and this is something you've got to do in this whole process, is think about it long and hard in terms of those um, levels there and where you are and what that actually means to you financially. Like, if you want to take two holidays a year overseas and fly their business class, what's the price of that? You know, if you want to buy a new car every second year, then what's that mean to you? So there's actually mathematics of this and you actually get to a point, and I won't bore you with the details in here, but I've actually got to find precisely, very precisely, what sort of money I need to make to be, for me to feel that I'm at those levels. And that came out of a process with the, with the Robbins books. So that's what I've got to say about that sort of thing. So you can actually work out the mathematics of that and come to understand what it means to you. Keep things simple. Um, I said it earlier, and I started on this, yeah? Uh, work smarter, not harder. I've always, the guy is a programmatic guy, IT guy, software guy, I've always been that guy that's been able to work things out. I put the time in, I go, you know, if I want that outcome, what I need to do is this, this, and this, and this. If I want to live on a boat, uh, okay, this is the process I've got to go through. So my version of that is certainly keep things simple, but work out a process. What are the steps you need to take to attain that outcome? If you're going to start in a position of, and, you know, of poor people and people who struggle with these things, say, oh, I could never have that. I could never have that. And, you know, as most of you know from my stories, I started in this place where post-divorce and suffering some depression, I was going, oh, I just wanted to live on a boat. I can never do that now. But I set my mind to it and got the outcome I looked for. So, um, so that's the thing. So there's always a process. So when it comes to simplicity, there's steps you take to get to where you're going. Are you in control? That's, that's an interesting one as well because we all like to feel that uh, to a certain extent we've got the things around us consistent, yeah? You know, even this morning is like we just become robots in what we do, don't we? we? We tend to follow the same path. I went for my regular meeting with my client this morning drove all the way to Brendale for 10 a.m. to walk into the coffee shop and go, he's not here. I was, oh shit, I'm at the wrong coffee shop, aren't I? I was like, oh sorry mate, I'll see you in half an hour back at Fonzie Abbott at bloody, wherever it is, Breakfast Creek. So, you know, but we all operate on a certain level of control and re reality and reliability around what we do. And sometimes we've got to shake that tree and change that for ourselves. Okay, always learning. Always learning. Don says YouTube. I love YouTube. Made a lot of YouTube. Watch a lot of YouTube. We all do. TikTok's taken over, in fact, from that. And if you want to learn things at TikTok speed, you're going to need a whole day. But, <laughs> but you know, there was actually a point in my life in, in my late 40s where I set out to read 52 books in a year. Now, I didn't get there. It took 18 months. It took 18 months. But I set out to read a, a, a book on wealth or leadership or finance or business every single week. Didn't get there quite in time, but geez, didn't it make a difference? And there's people to me that afterwards said, John, you've changed. I go, yeah, yeah, I have. So anyway, don't stop learning. Um, lack of fear and doubt. People are often surprised at me, and even recently someone said, oh, sorry about that, are you pissed off? You know, are you annoyed with me? You know, is that, I said, well, that'd be a waste of energy, wouldn't it? You know. And I tend to look upon everything in a very optimistic, and that's where Don and I truly connect, is we always have this optimistic outlook on life. And, uh, and he talks in his sort of things. I'm thinking about another example, but you know, I don't, you know, when people say, don't you get angry? I go, no, I've tried that. It's, it doesn't get the sort of outcomes I'm looking for. You know, or ang you know, angry or fearful or doubtful or something like that. And every time I look at those things and find myself thinking like that, I go, no, no, that's a waste of time. That's not getting me the outcome I want. So I approach everything with a level of optimism and happiness. And it, um, as much as you can drive that, you, um, you actually find yourself being labelled open-minded, don't you? So now as we go through these, I want, you, I want you, you guys to actually think about where you actually scale in each of these points. I think I actually score pretty well on most of these, but you know it's up to you to measure yourself and think what you actually feel about that yourself. Persistence. 
persistence, persistence, persistence. So, you know, the, the, the people we see recently in the Olympics, they didn't, um, you know, they would have had some bad days in the training field. They would have had a car breakdown or, um, you know, the, you know they, they would have had setbacks. But those gold medalists, even the silver and the bronze, the people who even turned up at the Olympics, they've been persistent unquestionably, haven't they? Um, do you gamble is a question, you know, so that's a question for you to pose for yourself. I take a, you know, take a, I find some sweeps to go into Melbourne Cup Day. I don't mind a friendly wager with friends, you know, when there's a bit of a bit of an argy, argy about, and I lost 50 bucks just like week, last week, just joyfully. I wasn't invested in that, you know, I've got to win or lose 50 bucks, so I just thought I was right. <laughs> um, live inside your means. I'm guilty of that. You know, I left university with a substantial credit card debt. I had a car. What I do when I was graduated uni, I want to show that I'd succeeded. What I do, I bought an, an, another more expensive car. We need a higher purchase. Never paid that off until 25 in a car that was worth far less. So living inside your means, and I think I actually do that pretty well now because, you know, while I want a Tesla, no, I've got my Sprinter. In fact, that's an amazing vehicle I've got out there. I go to the beach there, hang out every day, and a lot of people turn up and say, wow, that's amazing. And I say, yeah, that's great. But it still is not a car I bought new. It's a car I bought second hand, so living within your means, and I'm certainly doing that today. Delayed gratification, once again, uh, vehicles, lifestyle purchases, um, overseas holidays, those sorts of things. If you can put them off, it makes it a sweeter fruit. Remember when we actually were surprised and amazed at the Christmas presents we got? We didn't know what we were getting. It was a genuine surprise and that bit of meaning. Whereas if you discovered your Christmas presents a couple of days before Christmas or during December, their parents hadn't hidden them that well, you found yourself like going, oh, oh there's a bit, the surprise is gone. Because if you delayed it to Christmas Day, if you actually woke up to those presents, you're going, oh, wow, that was really special. Look at that thing. So anything around delayed gratification is really good. Love your work. I don't just love my work. I love my clients. I've got a successful business. Most of you guys know that. I love my clients. As I said, I got around to spending some time with my plumber today. And boy, isn't he a motivated go for it bloke. He's got 12 people working for him. He's doing a 75-day challenge. It includes two 45-minute uh, sessions of exercise every day. It includes doing some sort of volunteering. It includes reading 10 pages of reading every day, X, X, Y, Z. And he's got to do this in some app. The 75 day process he's putting himself through. He's super motivated. And I, as I said, I don't just love my work, I love my clients and I love my staff. You know, a member of my staff today admitted having a bit of a struggle with in his personal life at the minute. So I was going, look, I don't have a lot of family. I, you know, and so, you know, I don't have children. I don't have a lot of uh, relatives. So I said, you are my family, you know, I really do care for you. And he, f and he felt that uh, unquestionably. So it's there for you to consider around your work experience. Do you really like the people you work with? Do you like your boss? Do you like your, you know, your employees? Do you like your coworkers? Do you like your subordinates? Dreams, plans, goals. Uh, let's go for a slide and see if it's here. No, no it's not. I'm gonna do that. Didn't do it. Just bear with me a sec. I'm just gonna get this slide up here. Let's talk about goals. Who's seen SMART or heard of SMART goals? Anyone? Yeah, you've, okay, we've got a few people here. So let's deal with this. And this is actually something from a, a, field, of, uh, a field of knowledge and a sort of a, uh, uh, something I've subscribed to called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Who's heard of that one? Anyone? A few people in the room. So big fan of that. And it was something given to me as on the, on the flip side of divorce where I've gone, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with my life. And as I said, what I did determine out of that process, I want to learn it there, and the use of a smart goal, I went from oh, living on a sailing boat, sailing up the coast with a girlfriend, go heading for the Whit Sundays to live on a boat for as long as I want. That seemed very unattainable from a point of you know, post-divorce depression. Now with a smart goal, we got on with it. So, you know, and this is the thing. So let's write this out for me and play along with me uh, with your own one if you want to, is it's got to be specific. So. You know, when it, I get down to the level of specific where, you know, I said to myself, you know, um, do, 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 do measure of attainable realistic time bound. Okay, so my thing, and you know, you can buy boats for 10 grand, you can buy sailing boats for 20,000, you can buy boats for 30. My dream boat was half a million, but that was now impossible based upon divorce and where I was headed. But my specific goal was a 40 foot catamaran. So that was my specific goal, yeah? Um, 
And what I want to do is, is obviously sail that up the Queensland coast, sail the Great Barrier Reef. You know, and that's a, sort of a marker I use when I'm talking to people about their goals and their will, their, their plans and their dreams, is they go, they go, oh, I'd like to buy a boat. And I go, well, that's not very specific. What sort of boat? And they go, well, I don't know, just a boat, maybe a sailboat. And I go, well, you haven't really thought that one through, have you? You know, even a friend of mine, another example of that, where I was, I was speaking to a friend about, she's like, if someone gave me $10 million, I'd sell my business. And I go, well, how'd you come up with that number? He says, well, I could live comfortably for that. And I go, well, that's, you know, pretty gen general, isn't it? You're not going to convince anybody with that story, are you? You know, just $10 million, you know, you haven't calculated that. I mean, I've got a number for my business. It's $3.3 million. Now, that's not even based upon the worth of the business. That's based upon the sort of wealth that I can then generate and the lifestyle I can attain from $3.3 million. I can live very, very happily based upon my lifestyle for $3.3 million. So it's about being specific. But anyway, let's stick with specific here. So, you know, go away and think about what you want in life. Six months down the track, 12 months down the life, and apply the system. So anyway, sail the Great Barrier Reef, we'll put in here. Hasn't come with the people at home, it's just a bit more that way. Um, measurable, measurable, but make sure your goal is tractable. So it's like you see here, don't hide behind buzzwords like brand engagement, social influence, or um, you know, I want to be happy, you know. I want to be happy or I want to feel this way, or I want to feel love. It's like, well, no, what does that actually mean? You know, so, and for in this circumstance, as I said, very tangible, very tangible things, yeah? So measurable, a 40-foot catamaran definitely is tangible, yeah? Um, attainable. Now, as I said, what was interesting in my world is, is there was a $500,000 price tag attached to the dream boat, a Lightwave 38. I'd actually done web design and, and, and uh, social media stuff and all the rest of that for this company back in the day for this mob that made Lightwave 38s, and so that was unattainable. But what I found is I got said, well, is it actually attainable? Well, there are boats out there for a lot less than half a million bucks. And it was really interesting. It's like, in the end, this dream boat, and I, and I, I, I swear to it, it was a much more amazing boat for it, the flexibility and the lifestyle and what I did with it and what I, what I was happy with it in terms of its, you know, it as, a, as a sailing vessel was everything I wanted it more than the Lightweight 38. It cost me $135,000. And I found it after looking and looking and looking and focusing on what I wanted specifically. Didn't worry so much about you know, the price tag of it, but what I wanted to attain. This is what I wanted to attain, a 40-foot catamaran that's capable of sailing the Great Barrier Reef. And I said, found it for a fraction of the price. Realistic. So, and that's once again a revisit with what we just talked about. Half a million dollars at that point? No, no way it was ever going to happen in my life. Or in that, at that time in my life. But a $130,000 boat? Yeah, that was easy. Real easy. No. Um, paid, paid full ticket for it. Realistic. So, uh, and for, lastly, time bound. And that's where actually it's amazing how your brain sets to work when you do this properly. And, and give yourself a, a time-bound goal. So I wanted to sell the Great Barrier arriving by 1, one July yeah, of that year. Can't remember the specific year, but crazy on years. But anyway, so that time-bound thing that I had to gave it a lot of uh, motivation. So in the end, uh, do, running a process called Smart Goals, go look that up for yourself, have a long, good, hard, Think about, because who here has got goals? Has everybody here got goals? Have you got plans? Have you got something you want to achieve in life? If you actually apply that process, it gives you a lot more clarity about um, what it is you actually want. And that, I guarantee you, will give you more motivation to actually reach out and head that way. All right, what else we got? Plans, goals, asset versus income. Uh, what's my own version of that? Um, I think I had an epiphany about four or five years ago um, when I came back from the Wit Sundays, because you know, for most of you guys know, I was a web designer, yeah? Now web design used to be quite a lucrative gig, and you'd sort of make up numbers, and you'd actually do a quote, and you go, well, for that, sort of, for that sort of website back in the day, and I'm gonna spend three weeks on it at 80 bucks an hour, so your quote is X. So I, I applied to myself an hourly rate, and that's what I did. Now what corrupted that is an hourly rate for a website designers went through the floor because people were getting their stuff done offshore, you know, 
in the Philippines or India or elsewhere, the, you know, Eastern Europe, people would do websites for you for a fraction. So what I found myself is instead of being, you know, what well you're thinking, oh, I'm a senior web designer now, it's been 15 years, you know, now I was competing with guys who were charging, you know, 20 bucks, $15 an hour. Now the quality wasn't anything like what I was producing, but it was impossible to compete with. So assets versus income. Well, even my own take about that is even just, you know, self-worth and that sort of thing. And one of the hacks around I had around that was business, as you would have heard if you were here last week, is I got to the point where I just charged people a retainer. I say to my clients, you want an outcome? That's gonna cost you X amount per month. And they do the math based upon, well, that's gonna generate me this many clients and it's gonna generate me this much income. So that's 20 bucks per client. Wow, that's a good deal. So they don't think about how much effort you're putting in. They just think about the actual business outcome that it. So when you look at, when you, uh, the one of the key things I've got, just got to say about that is if you can get away from considering yourself at an hourly rate, as a business person, you look at sale price, cost, the rest is profit, and that money you deserve, it's got nothing to really to do with your own hourly rate. It's just how much can I muster to get, to get that outcome I'm looking for? How much profit margin can I squeeze out of that deal? Um, and there's certainly nothing wrong with it. Patience. Yeah, the, Don's spoken to that plenty. I don't think I need to go on about that much, but um, there's certainly some sort of pleasure. Oh, no, I have got something myself to talk about with that. You know, it's been 15 years that I've had investment properties in Early Beach, and I've been paying and paying, negative geared, bad loans, bad decision originally, but I've lived with it. Now, I've just refinanced, and actually I've got myself a nice little nest egg. I've got it into a situation where there's a nice, tidy profit per annum coming my way. So patience has paid off at 53. Um, questioning, certainly question everything. Um, you know, I sometimes actually, I actually like to sit around. I don't think I, what was the one you came up with, Don? I can't, what was the one you said? There's this people who convince as lizard people, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I love that one, yeah. It's like, it goes back to that series V, wasn't it? The lizard people running around the population. Um, it, uh, I don't question that, but I certainly, I don't mind if I'm a bit bored and when I want some mental tonic, I'll actually consider one of the foundations when I sit back and think, am I a generous person? Am I really a generous person? And I'll look for proof or disproof of that myself. So, um, so actually questioning um, is, is actually a healthy thing to do with your psyche, to actually dig into the depths of your mindset and consider the parameters of the world you live in. Um, and generosity. I love the generosity one because it's, and actually I do it in my business seminar for those who, and for those who weren't here last week. Um, I like to look at generosity as a, as a continuum because there's, in terms of, um, there's people who are not generous <laughs> and there's people that are very. Now when we say very generous, am I necessarily talking about money there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what 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 have we all got from Dom today, you know, and myself to a certain extent? Knowledge. You know, we, jo Dom's been very generous and has shown that time, year in, year out with these seminars, had just how generous he is with knowledge. And that's of extreme value to a lot of people. Time. This plumbing client of mine, he says, oh, I've started volunteering. I'm now, I go down once a month to a place where they feed the homeless and the, the people sleeping rough. He's just invested his time. He's a rich bloke, he doesn't need to do that. But he's got a certain amount of self-worth out of that, self-worth out of it. I myself have put in over the past three months about 100 hours into volunteering at vaccination hubs over here at Rock Lee. And that's been a lot of fun for me, a lot of self-worth out there. So that's generous, yeah? What other forms of generosity we got out there? So we've got time, we money, knowledge, you know. I, there's a lady turned up. I've had a fridge for sale on Marketplace. I've been stood up so many times. I got, I was surfing at sunset with this amazing sunset going on at Karaman yesterday. And I made a commitment to be back here at 7 p.m. so a woman could get a fridge off me. And my list price was 140 crummy dollars for a second hand fridge. Anyway, I've come in from the surf. My friends are still out there. I've looked at my phone and she says, oh, just before I come, I want to make sure um, that you'd be willing to accept $100 for that fridge. And I message back and says, sorry, I'm not interested. I'm going back for the surf. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth my time to come and meet you for that. Now what happened this afternoon? Or about midday I got a message from a lady. She said, um, 
you know, I'm looking for a fridge for an elderly friend of mine. Her fridge is burnt out. It's not going cold, and I've got it. And I'm going to come and pick it up and take it to up to Redcliffe to give it to her. And I go, well, if that's bona fide, if it's not bullshit, if she really is that person, it's going to take a fridge. You know what I did? I gave her the fridge, didn't I? She turned up and said, oh, I've only got 80 in cash, and I can give you 20 on a cr no, my crap. I said, no, no, let's lift the fridge in to your, to your ute, and off you go. Please give your aging friend my regards. So stuff, you know, just time, effort, money, you know, knowledge, and, uh, and actually I know that that pays in space. A little anecdote around that same thing, and that's why I give stuff away on Marketplace, is once upon a time I gave away a uh, home gym set home gym set. Some people, so this old bloke turned up and he's sitting there drinking tea while he's waiting and, you know, for me to finish a business call to help him. And I went out, he says, oh, this and that, and I live on Russell Island. I'm going, well, and this is just an example of generosity working in your favour, yeah? Is, I, I, he says, what are you doing here anyway? His name was Bert or something like that. I lived on, on Russell Island. I was taking it back to somebody who had a buggered knee. Anyway, so I said, well, let's come on, off you go, let's lift you. And he says, well, what do you do? I said, well, I've got a marketing business and I'll really work well with pest control business. You don't know pest control businesses, do you? Anyone that owns one? He's gone, Daniel. He said, Daniel, he's my best mate. He's got the property next door in Russell Island. I'll ring him now. And he's picked up his phone and he's like, Daniel, Daniel, I've got this guy, John Naylor here, wants to talk to you. <laughs> and, and so this guy is like, and I said, oh, we do this and do that. I said, no, mate, you, you, look, our stuff's as good as what you've seen, if not heaps better. And, ah, no, we've got all that stuff, I said. So anyway. On the back of the fact that this bird had given him a strong recommendation or just put him on the phone to me, that guy turned into a client who then shanghaied an arborist to become a client, who then had a referral from a, 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 a actual pool building business or pool maintenance business who's still a client today. So that giving away something, generosity, in that circumstance has actually netted me better than or grossed me more than $200,000. So I love giving stuff away. Anyway, so that's me pretty much done. Um, I did have something else here that... Escape plan towards places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I'll just refer to this. Uh, it's, it's a continuous, one of these NLP things that I learned back in the day as well. And it kind of sums up, I think, that whole thing that Don's talked about versus the poor versus the wealthy and their attitude. And certainly my attitude towards that it's their experience and a lot of people. As a lot of people, live their lives in a certain amount of pain. Whereas um, I think the smarter way to do it is to seek pleasure. You know, because if I could just make it, if I could just get a bit more overtime, if I could just, you know, if I wouldn't feel this pain, I wouldn't be in this situation. If the dog would stop barking, you know, <laughs> you name it, there's a lot of things that we do, there's a lot of, and a lot of people spend a lot of time and we see it in their faces, don't we? We see it in the crowds, we see it around us every day. People that are escaping pl pain. Uh, whereas, you know, um, you know, I know a person who's you know, got a rescue dog and gets an enormous amount of pleasure out of the fact that she's trained up this dog to just be one of the cleverest dogs. You know, she, she can get it to, and so it's really a pleasure to spend time with this Kelpie. It's an amazing dog, I've really grown fond of it. But, you know, it'll run across, you'll stand it over, sit over there and run towards you and you go bang and it rolls over and slides across the floor. <laughs> it does this really you know, amazing, thing, you know, trick of, be, of acting like it's being shot. So it, it, that's a thing. So whereas the guy over the back fence here, there's a pooch that barks, some little fluffy thing, you can hear that it's fluffy because it's for the muffled barks. And there's some guy over the back here every third day. He's like, shut up! <laughs> I don't know where the dog is. I don't know where he is. <laughs> but that guy's on this side of the ledger, isn't he? You know, where there's a more pleasurable thing to do. It's if you go with a smile on your face, say, you know, can I take your dog for a walk? I really like dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you don't bring it back. No, you wouldn't do that. You definitely bring it back. But anyway, as the, that's not a cross for me. That's a big thing. You, you spend your life seeking pleasure and focusing on the things you do want, not the things you don't want. That's pretty much the summary. Focus on the things you do want, not the things you don't want. If you want a life of living on the sea and living on a boat that, and sail a little bit Sundays, then focus on that, not the pain and suffering of some barky dog in, you know, three doors down. Does that make any sense? Okay. Round of applause for Don. Yeah. A little two-finger clap for me, you know. And uh, thank you very much.
Uh, next week is, um, I'm doing my Google Sheets talk, so if you haven't used Google Sheets ever, if you want to smart up on your spreadsheeting capabilities, uh, maybe you've used Excel a few times and you want to take it to the next level. Now that's orientated around the way, what do I do on that, don't I track, I, in my training around that I track the amount of money that I'm worth on a monthly basis. Do an assets type. I do an assets type thing and I do that on a monthly thing so I hold myself accountable for how much I'm worth. So I take you, set, show you how I set that up. I um, also go through stuff around share portfolios and how Google finance functions actually work to actually so you can import the price of share stuff live if you don't have one of these share portfolio managers. And otherwise, it's just a good time to come and hang out here again some more. And that won't happen online, by the way. I, I'm not, don't think I'm tech, I'm pretty tech savvy, but I'm not gonna be able to do that one online. You're gonna have to come in person for a change, yeah? All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Don. Um, thanks for sitting patiently while we all thought there was hail outside, didn't we, eh? Yeah. Even, sorry, I got a bit wet. My, te my tent, my guy downstairs, he's like, John, get your van out of the way. I want to put my Hyundai out the garage. And I'm going, well, we're all in this together, mate. I don't know why you feel you're special. But anyway, um, thank you very much. So was there hail that you noticed? No. No, no, we're all too optimistic for that. I mean, the, I mean, the pens and the things and all the rest are all floating around out there on the thing and all the washing's wet, but so what? Okay, let's give everybody a cheerio here. Thank you, oh, thank you. Thank you everyone at home. Yeah. There, I hope you got something from that. Ah. All right, good. A bit toasty in here now too, isn't it, with, it, with all the doors shut? So, does anybody want to share? Has anybody got a really big goal? Has anybody got something amazing? Um, oh, I'm, I'm interested in getting shares. <laughs> <laughs>